we do today what others won't, so we can do tomorrow what others can't. I want, one of my favorite, and we use it all the time in our training, is the old Smoke Jumpers Creed, and that is that we do today what others won't, so we can do tomorrow what others can't. And it kind of sets the stage for what I'm all about with my seal fit training and unbeatable mind, and that is that we train harder than expected or than is common. And then through that training and that development, you can do what is uncommon and unexpected in life. I used to say the more you bleed in peacetime, the less you bleed in war. Or the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't start out in my professional life saying I was going to be a Navy SEAL. I actually was, my first job was a CPA, believe it or not. I was in Manhattan working for a big eight accounting firm after my college career, which was back in the 80s. And I was kind of following this expected path. You know, both my family was a business family. You know, we had a, a family business that's been around for over 100 years. And where I went to school, everyone was either going into business, law, or medicine, pretty much. And so I kind of followed that path and ended up in Manhattan, you know, working away as a CPA, got my CPA exam, passed and went to NYU Business School, Stern School of Business, got an MBA there. This all this happened from like 21 to 25 years old. So anyways, Andrew, during this time, I also started really a physical person in college and, and leading up to college. So I was an endurance athlete and really into um, training. And I was really fit. And when I got into this workforce mode, I struggled to maintain that. And so, you know, I had a crazy schedule where I'd wake up every morning and go for a run, you know, like a six mile run. Then I'd literally go to work and then I'd sneak away at lunchtime to go to the gym to do some weightlifting. Then I'd go back to work. And then between work and my night classes at NYU, I, would, I started training in a martial art and that was called Sado. And their world headquarters on 23rd Street in Manhattan. And it, this was a, an inflection point in my life because I initially did it for the physical training and I soon found out that it was the mental training that was you know, the most valuable. And so through this work that I did at Sato, which was equal parts sitting on a meditation bench as it was pounding away on the dojo floor, I started to really tap into my intuition and kind of my just a deeper sense of what was meaningful and important to me in my life. And that's where I first started to define what it meant to be, in your words, what it meant to be a man and what it meant to live, you know, with passion and really what was my purpose in life. And so it forced me when I started to listen to that inner voice and pay attention to it. And then I started to journal about it and, and think deeply about it. It really caused me to take a um, hard look at what that purpose was for me. And I ended up doing a, a complete pivot from purpose was to be, you know, kind of a corporate guy, you know, climbing that ladder and going back into the family business to, I saw myself as a warrior and a leader and a warrior leader actually. And that I was meant to kind of play that purpose out on a, a much grander scale than being in the, in the corporate world, at least at that time. I, I do. I think that we have these patterns that kind of bedded within us at a per, pretty early age. And if we don't examine them, then we can we can kind of live a life that is someone else's life. And, you know, sometimes we wake up and, and a lot of people have that quintessential midlife crisis because they've never really deeply examined the rationale and the purpose behind why they're doing what they're doing. And then, of course, as you're quite aware, the longer you stay and get en entrenched in, you know, a career or a, a path that is not right for you, and now you've got a family and you've got a house to support and all that, then more risky it appears to make any kind of change. You know, I guess in a way I was fortunate to, to figure this out at 25 and, and I was able to make that shift and I said, okay, I'm, I'm going for the Navy SEALs. That was really what my spirit was telling me to do. And, and um, so I used every skill that I learned from Nakamura, Grandmaster Nakamura and his mental training really. And that was what allowed me to kind of sail through the SEAL training and, and graduate as honor man in my class. And we had 180 people start and only 19 of us graduated. And I, was, I graduated number one, and, and that was not, to me, it wasn't a big deal because it was something that I expected. You know, I really had trained my mind, and I, I kind of knew the outcome in advance, which is pretty cool. And, and I, I say that only because I'm alluding to really the, what I teach nowadays in my, um, in my book, The Way of the Seal, and in my Unbeatable Mind program is, is how do you win in advance? How do you set the conditions for great success and great victory 
you know, before you even step foot in the battlefield. And that, that's something I figured out early on in life as I went into the SEAL teams and then I reinforced it in the SEALs and probably the most remarkable team on the planet of successful men, you know, accomplishing great deeds. And it's my vision and you know, new purpose in life, you know, if you will, is to teach as many people what I learned as possible. You know, and I, I tried to figure out how to create a pill for people to take that would give them this mental, mental mindset, but I failed so far in that. So I've got to teach you the old fashioned way, you know. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Well, I went into the SEALs in 1989. Actually, went through Officer Canada School in 89. I went through my SEAL training class, which was actually 170. I, I had orders to go to 171, but when I showed up in Coronado to the SEAL training compound, it's called BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training, and I, I realized that class 171 wasn't going to, quote unquote, class up for, I think, like nine or ten weeks. I wrangled my way into class 170, and um, you know, I was just determined to just get busy, you know, to get started training. But um, to answer your question, when I had this kind of these insights pop up, most of them when I was on the meditation bench, you know, for 45 minutes at a time at, at the Sato Karate Dojo, I, you know, I started to, like I said earlier, sense that I was a misfit in the, my chosen career at the time, and so. I started to think clearly or deeply about what was it that would be more aligned and, and so I went through this process of really identifying those things that I was passionate about and what came up for me was really passionate about leadership and yet I, I didn't see a lot of leadership, true leadership where I was in the corporate world and I was really passionate about physical training and being fit and so that was one of the things that first led me to the SEALs because they were legendary for their physicalness, right, for their fitness and their mental, you know, mental toughness. And I was really passionate about the outdoors and adventure type things, right? And so all these, it, it was pointing, number one, it was pointing away from the corporate grind and pointing toward something that was adventurous. And so then when I kind of lined up this idea of leadership and adventure and fitness and challenge and risk, all of which defined my character, I started to narrow it down to let's say like two or three potentialities. One of them was to fly jets for the Marine Corps. One of them was to go work, you know, as a uh, swashbuckling guy on an oil rig, you know, and I quickly discarded that idea because that sounded boring after I'd lived with it for a few days. And then the one that was kept on percolating to the top of the list was to be a Navy SEAL. And I, I understood the odds, too. You know, like I knew and I was being told by the recruiter that I didn't stay in the snowball's chance in hell and that we're going to take about two guys that year through the officer candidate process. Statistically, I didn't have much chance of making it and that that didn't deter me because it was more of an inner sense that I felt okay that's that's it that's me that's where I'm supposed to be and then when I decided to go for it that's when I turned the dial up on the training and I looked at the training is is a multifaceted approach to guarantee success and you know it's that that idea that I've carried with me throughout my life is we train for life we train to succeed and then we go act out that success in our business, in our family, in our you know, physical training, different domains. But training to me is, is as important as eating and sleeping. And, and those are three legs of optimal living, you know, eating, sleeping, and training, and doing well in all three of those domains. Everything else flows from there. For sure. And I, I think that to expand the concept of training to include uh, other aspects of yourself rather than just the physical. And so, I, you know, I get that. Like, if, if training is just physical, and we're going to go just to go get my ass kicked at the dojo day in and day out, or if I'm just going to go to the CrossFit gym and grind away day in and day out, and I don't have any mental training that corresponds to that, that's just like lighting up my inner life and fine tuning my mind and my emotional life or self as well as my spiritual self, then it all kind of lacks meaning and eventually you hit that really tough spot, the dark night of the soul and you quit. Or you know, you just get bored, right, and move on to the next thing. So what, what I teach and what works for me is that training starts with training the mind and we train the mind by developing mental control and by developing this sense of positivity, right, so this really creating rich internal conditions for positive forward momentum in our lives. And then the physical training is to support the structure, right? The physical structure of your body and to be able to optimally perform under stress and toward your specific targets and goals, whether they be athletic or work related or family related or adventure related or whatever. And so I teach what, what I call the five mountains and it's an integrated approach to training your entire being. 
And so, you know, the first mountain is your physical development, and that's the one that most, you know, people are comfortable with. But even so, most people don't really train themselves physically in a thoughtful, methodical manner that leads to optimal performance over life. You know, they often will um, crank away for a, like a weight loss goal. And then once they hit that goal, you know, they lose inspiration and they have no reason to train. And so then they'll fall off or they'll ship fire or they'll train for an athletic goal. And when that vent is over, then they're wandering, wondering what's next. Our approach is to train for life, right? You, you put yourself on a deliberate, thoughtful training plan, and then you're working toward these specific goals in strength and stamina and your ability to do a lot of work. And you measure your progress all along the way and you do it with a team that becomes your kind of tribe, so to speak, and they hold, you hold each other accountable and it's a hell of a lot of fun and you make great progress. And so that physical training becomes really neat and a source of great inspiration and internal reward. But that's just the structure of the physical part. Now, the mental training, and I won't go into excruciating detail here because I could, I could, you know, we could go too deep really quickly. The mental part starts with developing control, mental control. And in order to develop mental control, ironically, we need to develop physiological control. So the, the first place to start, and this is going to sound kind of quirky, but the first place to start to develop mental control is through breathing control. So one of the, the real simple practices that I have my trainees do is something called box breathing, which is a, is a deep diaphragmatic breathing process. And what happens when you do this is it, it collapses your attention to the breathing process itself. Now, this is a, a training practice. It's not something you do, you know, every day or in the midst of a firefight, but it's a training practice. You do it just like you would train doing an Olympic lift or a deadlift or something of that nature. We do box breathing before every workout with Seal Fit, and it's to basically develop physiological and mental control. And there are other things. So I have a, a guided visualization, which is to still your mind. I actually drew this inspirationally from Grandmaster Nakamura back in New York, you know, when I was training in Sado. And we had a lecture called Still Water Runs Deep. And so I have a visualization where I take you to a still water place. And, you know, you connect with that depth of your character and connect with what I call your witness, which is, you know, essentially that part of you that is always watching and always witnessing. And, and start to develop the ability to watch and track your cognitive thoughts, your rational thoughts. What you notice is that, you know, how little control most of us have over those thought processes. And what we do then is when we develop that space where we can witness it, then we can take control back and use our mind as the forceful tool and ally that it's meant to be, as opposed to the feisty fiend that's always torpedoing our greatest dreams and desires because we just can't control it. It's running away all the time and thinking negative thoughts and not being super productive for us. So that mental control process, it takes some time, but once we develop that physiological control through the deep breathing, then we learn to basically witness the thought processes. And then the next stage is to interdict anything that doesn't belong, anything that's negative, anything that's not supporting our goals and objectives. And so then that requires, you know, there's some decisions that we have to make in this process. Because what we realize oftentimes is how many things that we focus our energy on and our mind is rattling off about that really are unimportant and not related at all to our primary goals in life. And furthermore, it's a skill in and of itself to determine what goals we should be going after that are really, really the sweet spot for us as, you know, as a unique human being. It could, it could come in many forms, but what I find is the most insidious are essentially the inner dialogue around failure, around fear two of the most common problems. So you might have a very well constructed goal to let's say start a business or you know, to enter in a new relationship. And yet, you know, your mind is constantly chattering about how it's not going to happen for you, how you're not that lucky or you're not worthy or you can't do this because you don't have the skills or it's other people who have that kind of success or they're lucky and you're not. It could be a million things. And it's not platitudinal. I mean, these are real thought processes. These are real internal dialogues that are going on, and they're rooted in some false belief system. And so you've got to approach it two ways. You can attack the belief system, or you can attack the dialogue and get to the belief system, and then route that out. But you can't do either until you develop awareness of what's going on. And so that awareness is what I'm talking about. This is the, kind of the first step is slowing things down, spending time in silence and getting control of our minds so that we can witness that whole dialogue that's going on. And then what we'll do is we interdict it by literally forcibly 
removing those thoughts or having them, you know, come to a screeching halt. And, you know, your mind, like I said, when you tell it to stop thinking something, it will for a brief moment. And then it'll go, you know, realize that, hey, you weren't really serious and it'll start clicking back in. So you got to interdict it and then redirect, which is kind of the next step. And so you then actively redirect it by actively thinking about something that is what you need to be thinking about or want to be thinking about. So it's positive and redirectional in a, in a new direction. And then you have to maintain that thought power by reinforcing that thought because it's very easy to slip back into that negative pattern. So this whole process, what I call it, witness, interact, interdict, redirect, and then maintain is really kind of the beginning of developing mental control. Sure. The front sight focus is a process to, you know, I mentioned while I was having a dialogue about mental control that oftentimes it's difficult for us to know what is the right thing to focus on. And this comes from a principle that we had in the SEALs. It's really simple, but basically called the KISS principle, you know, keeping it simple. And in order to keep things simple in your life or on a mission, you need to know what to focus on. What's the right thing to focus on? And so there's really two ways that we focus. One is that broad focus on, on the future goal, the mission set. And the other is the very narrow focus on the task at hand, the smaller task that's going to get us to the next step in the right direction toward that overall goal. And another way to look at this is to have a, an external focus on where you're going and the external environment around you and an internal focus on the conditions in your inner space. And that kind of brings me back to that mental control. So the inner focus needs to be on, if I've got a goal and my team is geared toward or seeking to accomplish a mission, then it's really important that my inner space is also geared toward accomplishing that mission. And that means, again, that my dialogue and the imagery that I'm using to construct my world with internally are imagery and dialogue of you know, mission success and kicking ass and taking names. And you route out all weakness internally so that you don't have that weakness interrupt your mission accomplishment externally. So the process of front sight focus kind of follows a method to, you know, really clarify what things you should be focusing on, selecting the right targets, and then envisioning, you know, your goal, defining the mission properly, and then really decluttering and simplifying things around you so you can laser focus on the mission and execute with precision. So, you know, that's one of the things with like SEALs are really successful as a team because focus on one mission at a time and they're just able to really declutter everything else and get it off their plate and so they just can they become like these laser beams. And most people most people go through life like floodlights, focus is being diffused all over the place and they wonder why it's so hard to get anything done. Right. And technically, you know, it's kind of like the idea of microtasking, but at a much bigger level. You really, truly can only do one meaningful thing at a time. I mean, you can do some mundane tasks, you know, simultaneously, but only one really meaningful thing at a time. And it's the same thing with goal accomplishment. So it's important that whatever goal you're working on right now is tied to or connected to your broader, bigger goal, your bigger mission, which is connected to your life purpose. And so kind of like you line all these up and that means that every action you take is going to have power and it's going to develop momentum. And so again, back to the SEALs, they develop incredible momentum because every action they take you know, is really something that's going to impact and move the dial toward mission accomplishment. They don't waste their time with things that aren't going to do that. And then what happens is that we learn to execute really quickly and to move fast and to find the failure points because we expect failure. Right? We condition ourselves to embrace failure. We know it's going to happen. We know that no plan survives contact with reality or with the enemy. So we want to get out there and find out where those friction points are so we can learn from them as quickly as possible. And then we shift fire and adjust and then move even faster to the next friction point. So in a way, we just kind of fail forward to our mission success. You learn to learn and you learn to learn from your mistakes and you find you realize very quickly in that environment Your mistakes are your biggest teachers. And that, you know, those points where the, you know, Murphy bops his head in and makes something break or go wrong, those are also opportunities. And there's great opportunity in those areas because the same thing is happening to everybody else, you know, in a different way. And so those areas where there's friction and, and things break is where, 
you can find creativity and innovation. Well, you know, Andrew, I think one of the biggest lessons I learned is that leadership is super overhyped as a concept. Ultimately, to me, leadership is about authenticity. And it's about really being as true to yourself and developing that integrity and in thought, word, and action. And so when you do this, right, when you actually try to be a real person and to, you know, not think you're Superman or better than anyone else or, you know, you've got all the answers, but you literally can go into uh, your team and say, listen, here's the mission and who's got some ideas and really lean on your team and say, I'm here to, I'm here to support everyone I can. This is, here's what I think. And I want to hear what the team thinks and let's, you know, let's solve this thing together. Of course, I'm accountable for the results and I'm gonna be held responsible to as high a standard as you, if not higher, because I'm gonna lead from the front. But in that leading from the front, I, I get behind and, and push the team and serve the team. And ultimately what develops there, and also you know, one more thing, is that transparency and humility are critical for leaders. Transparency in the fact that the more information you can share, the more ideas will permeate and grow. It's like the Petri dish for ideas. If, the more you block information and hide information or think information doesn't belong, disseminated, then the bigger risk you are of, of having bottlenecks and not finding those innovative ideas, those breakthrough ideas. That's one thing. And then humility, it's okay to admit your fuck-ups, right? I'm very open about my screw-ups. I think that people like to see that leaders are human because we are, after all, everyone is. And you know, just because you're in a leadership role or some sort of positional power doesn't mean you're impregnable or you're, you, know, you don't make mistakes. You do, and people see them because people watch your actions and could care less about your words. So humility is really, really important. All this points to authenticity being kind of the, you know, my catchword for just being real. And what that means is that you're trusted. You have this great trustworthiness energy field around you. And trust is the glue that bonds a team together and that leads to hyper performance. You know, the more trust you have, the more speed of execution, the more performance you're going to have as a team or as an organization. The less trust, then obviously the less you're going to have. And so to me, leadership is really about authenticity and, and developing that trust bond and then getting out of your own way and letting the team, you know, just crush it. I think leaders are made, you know, everyone's got the raw material as a human being for greatness and it's really up to our life conditions and our our own inner space our ability to really tap into our power to get out there and lead you know and I've seen some of the most unlikely people be the some of the most incredible leaders you know having said that there are conditions that you know you could be born in a certain time or place or with certain physical conditions or mental conditions that are gonna preclude you from being a leader but you know, as a general rule, all things being equal, leadership is by and large a learned or a trained aspect of one's character. Absolutely. You know, I think it's really important. I alluded to earlier that we like to train in an integrated manner, and that's really what separates SEAL Fit from like any fitness program. In fact, I don't even look at it as a fitness program. It's a, it's a developmental program, and it's born out of the warrior tradition and so the, the five human capacities that we develop are the physical the mental the emotional intuitional and the spiritual and I use the term spiritual to really mean you're kind of non-quitting warrior spirit your willpower maybe that connection to your your actual soul that is giving you some deep insights and is going to kind of drive a lot of your behavior in life at a deep deep level once you kind of connect to it so you know, it has no religious connotation in it, and it's completely compatible with anyone's religious orientation, this idea of developing your spirit, your warrior spirit. Now, one of our programs is a 50-hour nonstop training event called Kokoro Camp. I modeled it loosely after the Navy SEALs Hell Week, except one of our, our main objectives is to teach mental toughness, emotional resiliency, and warrior spirit, and to help you find that aspect of yourself through this training. And we call it, it's also a crucible experience, which means, you know, it's, it's intense, right? It's like a crucible is where you, you know, you forge steel. And so how does this work to develop your spirit? Well, the interesting thing is it's challenging physically, right? And so it's not something you take on lightly. A lot of folks train for it for over a year. Even, you know, top CrossFit Games athletes have done it and they're like nervous going into it, you know? And because uh, it's challenging physically. 
And so there's a point where you physically won't be able to accomplish the tasks that are put in front of you. So then you think, okay, what's next? Well, I, I'm going to mentally gut my way through it, and I'm going to prove that I'm mentally tough, and I'm going to you know, forge my mental toughness through this training. Well, guess what? We keep you awake for 50 hours, which means you're actually really awake for like 70 hours or something like that, you know, given the time that you um, got there and woke up and all. And then we also subject you to extreme cold, right? And so the, the Pacific Ocean can sap your, your heat really quickly, and this is one of the techniques they use in SEAL training to really get into the mental toughness aspect and try to test people and see how they're going to hold up, what's their fortitude going to be like in those extreme conditions, because combat is extreme. And so we use those same things. And so guess what? In those With sleep deprivation and being freezing cold for a long period of time, your mental condition starts to fray a little bit. And so then you're left with two of your primary pillars, like literally been swept away from you. you know, like your physical structure feels weak or it's breaking down. And your mental faculties that you, you know, normally rely on are starting to go somewhere else too. You know, might, might experience hallucinations or something like that. And this is something we all did in Hell Week. And I know, you know, some people are going to listen to this and go, wow, that's crazy. Why would you subject yourself to this? And the real, reality is that it's because of what happens next is you end up tapping into part of yourself which is I can only describe as warrior spirit and I, I use the term kokoro which is a Japanese word it comes from the warrior tradition uh, the martial arts and it means to merge your heart and your mind in action and so you literally have to get out of your head and start thinking of you stop thinking your way through it and you start feeling your way through the event and you do this in the context of being right there, helping your team, having your team help you, opening yourself up, like literally opening your arms up to receive help from your team, and then returning that in kind. And all of a sudden, you start feeling your way through the event, literally, like your mind is shot and your body is shot. I mean, I'm not saying you're, you're useless. I'm just saying that those tools have been greatly eroded. So you end up having to rely on a much deeper aspect of yourself. And you, know, you could literally equate that to saying, okay, spirit, step up to the front now and guide me through this because I can't do this alone. And that act of doing that, asking to dig deeper into yourself and also reaching out to your teammates, then most of the trainees, if not all of them, have these radical breakthroughs and really these altered states where they come out of the training with a new sense of who they are and what it means to be a human being and what it means to be a teammate, and what it means to love someone, right? Another word that we don't have great nuance for in, in the West. It's, you know, it's a powerful word to use in a team context. Like, I can honestly say that I loved my teammates, and we just don't have a way to say that very well in the Western world. But, you know, at Kokoro Camp, when we're finished, and grown men are hugging each other with tears streaming down their face, it's super powerful. I mean, it's, it's a new experience for most people, and it can only be described as love. It's powerful. So we have this saying that, you know, you meet yourself for your first time at Kokoro Camp. Is Kokoro Camp the only way to, to get this experience? Absolutely not, you know, but it's, it's a super powerful one because we've designed it in this manner to, to really achieve these results. So that's what I mean. You know, how do you train spirit? You can do it a couple ways. One is through a crucible, hopefully not one that, that comes to you like cancer or an accident or the loss of a loved one. But I have this saying, Andrew, you take yourself to the challenge before the challenge comes to you so that you're prepared. So the crucible experience is to challenge yourself and to learn to find this part of yourself that you know is going to be there for you in any circumstance. And then after that, everything seems easy. You know, after people do our training, you know, everything else in life looks easy. They start to see themselves as much more powerful and courageous and as sheepdogs and warriors, and, and then that ripples through every aspect of their lives, their work life and their, their family life, and they just start showing up differently, more authentically, more powerful, you know, making good decisions, being more focused, more confident, all that kind of stuff. The other way to do it is just through a, a serious discipline to a long-term commitment to a practice like you have with jiu-jitsu or with, I particularly love yoga. Yoga is my long-term practice. And to stay, stay the path day in and day out or, or four or five times a week. You know, get on the mat or get on the dojo floor and just continue to really refine and sharpen the sword. And over time, you, you, you kind of come to the same result. Well, my mission is to create kind of a new breed of warrior for the 21st century. I think warfare and the human race has gotten to a point where if we keep doing the same thing and expecting different results, then we all should go to the loony bin. We're in trouble as a society, right? We, we are. I mean, as a global society, we got to start doing things differently. 
So when I teach spec ops candidates, you know, I'm teaching them yoga, meditation, breath control, visualization, along with all the hardcore functional fitness that we do in SEAL Fit, you know, using team drills such as log PT and grinder PT and CrossFit and Olympic lifts and power lifts and all this. And so this is an unbelievably cool amalgamation of East meets West without any of the cultural nuances of the East that people may be uncomfortable with. So what happens out of that is you get a much more thoughtful warrior and thoughtful leader. And I have this kind of sense that a warrior goes through stages, right? When they're young, they're a warrior athlete. And then, you know, when they get into their 30s and 40s, and this, this model applies to whether you're a warrior in, in a military sense or a corporate warrior or just a, a stay-at-home mom, you have the, this stage where you're kind of physically active and athletic and you're a warrior athlete. And then you go into this warrior leader kind of stage where you're either leading a company or leading your teams or, you know, leading a family. And then you become more thoughtful about things and you start to really investigate human nature and the nature of truth and reality. And you become kind of a warrior philosopher. And then ultimately, you know, you go into this stage where you're a warrior monk. And that, that's kind of a neat model. And I, so I think what I'm trying to do is, is set the stage for that with my spec ops candidates and say, okay, it's not about just joining the military so you can go kill bad guys. You're going to get to do that. And you better hope that, you know, you're thoughtful about it and that you're killing the right bad guys. And, oh, by the way, you want to make sure this is, guy needs to be killed because maybe there's a better solution, right? And so ultimately, true warriors are the last to pick up the gun, the last to pick up the lance, and they abhor war. And that was my experience as a SEAL. And my, the best SEALs that I ever operated were this way. They're extremely thoughtful. You know, a lot of them are Ivy League educated. And they're like PhDs who carry a weapon in a rucksack and, and have a dive rig on. And, you know, we knew that warfare was horrible and, you know, it was the last resort. And we really despised it when, you know, politicians led us into conflicts that were not well defined and, and maybe didn't weren't grounded in, you know, what we believed to be rightness. And so any, anyways, you know, we still had to serve and do our duty and that's all fine and good. But at least in the act of warfare, we could be thoughtful and be um, true to a higher cause and to make sure that we're representing humanity and, and not just our egos. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but that's really my mission when it comes to the spec ops candidates and the young guys is to plant the seeds for kind of a new breed of warrior and to teach them you know, mental toughness through these principles that are perennial and been around for thousands of years but have been inaccessible now to the average Westerner because he didn't understand and didn't want to go put a gi on or go spend time on a yoga mat. And a lot of those teachers didn't know how to teach it anyways. So, you know, it's kind of a knee and it's working, right? I've got probably about 40 or 50 guys now who are in the SEALs wearing tridents who've been through my training and, you know, they all love SEAL fit. And, you know, I'm not saying they, they practice all the skills every day, but they're certainly very aware of them and they come back and train with me whenever they can. And it's pretty neat. And so then we've got people around the world who are following us and starting to learn the skills. And you know, we just got back from Canada. Canada training a Canadian military unit and we got Chilean special forces who you know use seal fit and we're starting to create a little a few ripples I think and uh, it's pretty gratifying actually. No you know there there has I once had a contract you know some of the stats that you referenced in the intro were from a government contract I had to mentor seal candidates nationwide and it was it was kind of a distasteful experience because they really tied my hands and wouldn't let me do pretty much anything that I'm doing right now. And I got out of that so I could really work with people at an individual level. I think that the institutions of the military aren't quite ready for what I'm doing. It's going to take another, you know, probably a generation of, or, or 10 to 15 years of guys going through the training who then get into leadership roles who go, you know, we need to do this. You know, it's interesting. The Canadians hired us because their, their commanding officer at this unit literally said they've lost the ability to teach warrior spirit. And they looked at us and said, you know, we know how to teach warrior spirit. And it was the troops that found us. It wasn't the command. It wasn't the institution. It was the troops that said, we want seal fit. And, you know, we were up there for three days training this, this 50, 50 hand selected guys. It was fascinating and they loved it. And it was really rewarding for us as well. And that's kind of neat, though, it's, but it's indicative of the fact that, you know, maybe the Canadians are more open than, than the U.S. military. But I think there's some pockets of military who are starting to look at this and say, wow, that's interesting. Maybe we, maybe we can do more of that. So I expect, you know, that someday, probably in the next three to five years, we'll have some work with the SEALs proper or, um, you know, the Navy in general. And I know there's some studies that are going on. You know, the Western kind of approach is to 
study it and you know until you got 12 research projects that verify it and validate it and take 15 years and that's not my approach my approach is to experiment on myself first and then a small tribe and then expand it out and what we're doing works i tell you what it really does spend as much time in silence as you can and let your mind settle and allow your inner wisdom to start to guide you back toward your purpose. You know, if anything, it was, you know, some deeply rutted patterns that were embedded in me at a very young age by uh, my family or my, you know, particularly my father who was pretty ag aggressive, you know, I don't need to say much more, but he's a really aggressive guy and, and is somewhat abusive, but uh, super great guy now and he's you know he's obviously come a long way but you know there were there were moments and and those things that you know in all of us right every one of your audience members has some instance in their childhood you know it may just be once or maybe recurring where they were injured or wounded and then they took that wound and they literally buried it and that it's still showing up in their life today in a way that they don't understand and so I had to work through it in my own life and when I figured it out it was extremely liberating and I encourage everyone to really do that kind of work, like that deep, deep work in the help of a professional therapist or you know, someone who really understands how to get in there and route out you know, those beliefs and patterns that were planted there through no fault of your own at a very young age. And so that's, you know, for guys is hard territory to go. You know, we were afraid to go there, right? We're not built to be emotional beings. We like to pretty much put up a, a steel wall around all that stuff. But the reality is that's a... That's your next frontier, you know what I mean? Emotional development and resiliency is, it's extraordinary what opens up for you when you start to develop that awareness of your emotional life and understand what was kind of like driving your behavior based upon these, you know, these things that happened at a very young age. And then you can go back and change it. You literally can go back and shed the light of awareness on those situations and then connect with the root emotion that was... Um, that was caused and transmuted into something else that became like anger or anxiety or whatever it was and then heal that and it's very very uh, liberating when you do that and so yeah I would I've referenced him a few times but my first mentor and you know just an incredible impact on my life was this guy Tadashi Nakamura who was the founder of Sato Karate and I was just dumb lucky to be to move you know a few blocks from his world headquarters and you know, I've modeled some of my life after him because what I really appreciated about Mr. Nakamura, the Grandmaster Nakamura, was that, you know, he wasn't out there on book tours and he wasn't out there, you know, away all the time doing doing whatever, business or this or that. He made it a point to stay close to home and to teach because that's where he felt he could make the biggest impact is by teaching. And so, you know, he was my instructor, even though uh, there were tons of other black belts and there were tons of classes, you know. He taught white belt classes, and I was in his class, you know, three, four times a week for years, for four years, and got my black belt, you know, under his watchful eye. And he taught me how important humility was and humor and just being super present, you know, every moment. And then that was found through the training. You know, the, the lifestyle of the warrior was to come and to train hard in a community of committed peers and then to sit on the bench also with that community to um, to scrub the inner mirror so to speak and so he was probably the most impactful in my life especially as I look back and think okay yeah there's there's a man who literally changed the direction of my life you know from CPA to SEAL and taught me some skills probably unbeknownst to him even that have led to you know me a lot you know allowing me to teach mental toughness and, and development of warrior spirit to a whole new generation of, of warriors and professionals. So thank you, Kaicho Nakamura. Yeah, I love, I love Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. I kind of stumbled across that at a pretty young age. I've read it seven or eight times since. I mean, every time I read it, I learn something new. It's just awesome. It's one of those books, if you let the title fool you then well don't let the title fool you let's just put it that way it's really not about getting rich it's about thinking and how to think well it's very cool so that had a big impact on me I think um, William James Men Thinketh is really another one that's really powerful uh, and, and there's another one that is you know I've, I've got so many books that had an impact on me but one that really really opened my eyes toward the eastern way was the autobiography of a yogi by, by Yogananda yeah, I guess that's his last name, Yogananda. 
and he started the Self-Realization Fellowship, which is right down the street from me. It's passed away about 20 years ago, but uh, this is a really interesting look at yoga and some of the yogis out there and this whole idea of yoga as a human development system as opposed to, you know, some just flopping around on a mat. And it's just a brilliant book and a really fun read. Those, those are uh, three good ones that I think are um, perennial and I, I always come back to those. So I like to read these every once in a while, you know, very inspiring. <laughs> I, would, I would tell him not to drink so much <laughs> and I would tell him to get his ass into the dojo as soon as possible. I think my 20 year old self hadn't quite found the structure for how to train myself you know I was just kind of flailing around you know working out like a madman and I had you know I had a little bit of attachment to my ego still and so yeah it would be to, to get get over yourself and start taking uh, taking your training more seriously and taking care of your inner life a little bit better yeah I agree I think that um, we should stop paying attention to what our society is saying a man is and start listening to our inner voice and here's one way to start turn off the damn TV I have not had a TV in my house in 12 years and it actually is painful for me to turn on TV and watch regular TV so I won't even do it even when I travel I just can't do it it's just so much crap and, and the imagery is so bad and it's so fast and it literally hurts my brain to watch 20 minutes of TV because I've conditioned itself I've conditioned it to think you know just absorb senseless information but our society's meme or value system around men's has been really damaged in this last kind of last wave of social experimentation and it's up to us like you me and, and your listeners and my tribe to really like bring it back and so men can be warriors and we can develop the skills of warriors but also be super compassionate emotionally balanced and deep and transparent and also uh, able to love each other as men and also able to love our women even better at a more deeper level. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, we should follow our passion and connect with our purpose and develop a strong ethos or stand around how we're going to live and what we're not going to accept in life. And man, it's it's powerful when you do this. And and every day you wake up just with your hair on fire passionate about where you're going and what you're doing because you're really clear about why you're doing it. And then from there, you know, people start to line up behind you and you become a leader and, and you know, all of a sudden you got a nice tribe around you who are all kicking ass and taking names and feeling good about themselves and feeling good about being a man. And guess what? I think, you know, the more people we can get, the more guys we can get, you know, kind of on the bandwagon with this, with this philosophy, it'll be a game changer. You know, it'll take some time, but you know, the ripple effects will be enormous. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, and awareness is the first step. And then from there, you got to take, take action. The action is to, to begin to, to learn more and to investigate and to train. You know, and that's where I come in. I try to provide the structure to train, to train you to be a, a warrior, a leader, and to, to operate at a higher level, you know, a more, more thoughtful and, and ethics or character-driven or character-bound approach to living. And it's extraordinarily said, very, very rewarding when you kind of lean into that. You know, what I'd just say is that it's the journey, not the destination that's important when you're on a path like this of great self-discovery or change or transformation. And so to really enjoy the journey, we, you know, I have this saying with our team, you know, we like to embrace the suck. And that is, you know, we show up every day and do the work and enjoy each other and enjoy the journey and, and try to maintain or develop that idea that, hey, could they, today could be the last. So better live every day as if it was your last because it might be. And I think about Nakamura again, and, and one, one of his Zen lectures was literally titled One Day, One Lifetime. And it's such a powerful concept because, you know, if you approach every day as if it was a lifetime, then you can literally fit a lifetime in a day. And then ultimately, you know, when you get to the end, wherever that is and whenever it is, then you have no regrets whatsoever. You know, you're completely filled up with this life that you've lived. And I think ultimately you ask, how do you be a man? It's just to live the life you were meant to live with no regrets. What gets me up in the morning and excites me is exactly what we're doing right here, Andrew. I mean, it's, uh, it's to teach people, it's to be a leader and a, an example. And so I get up, and check this out. I, my training center is in 
Encinitas, California, kind of up the road from you, two blocks from the beach. It's 20,000 square foot indoor outdoor training center. And we do all of our seal fit camps and academies and programs from here. But I, I like to stay here and it's seven minutes from my house. And, you know, we'll come in every morning and from seven to nine, I train with my seal fit team. And, you know, we do this seal fit operator workout, which is no joke. I mean, it's two hours of of hard hitting training and, and I'm 50 years old and I can, I can, most days I just crush it with all the young guys and the training just keeps me very young and very, you know, alive. It feels fantastic. You know what I mean? I'm working on, you know, new PRs for my deadlift and Olympic lifts, you know, and we're doing 185 pound uh, Olympic cleans today along with box jumps and sprints and, you know, it's just fantastic. So every day I get up and I got that to look forward to. And I also know that every day I'm going to be able to do a couple other things. One, I'm going to be able to train my my mind and my spirit. And so I take time every day to do some yoga and some breathing exercise and some visualization. And I also am sure that I am really connected with my family and my team. And so I deliberately take time to really spend time with them, you know, figure out what's motivating them, what's going on in their lives. And, you know, and all of this is very, very inspiring. You know what I mean? So I, I get inspired and people are inspired by me and it all becomes this like upward spiral of inspiration and so the energy around here is fantastic like we all love being here i mean how cool is it to love like love 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 going to work and wouldn't everyone want to have that and so i I just feel incredibly lucky you know really blessed and you know i want to share that with anybody i can it's just cool it's cool and i think that everyone can tap into that at some level